invoking the divinity within us. So if you don't mind, you can repeat after me. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Thank you for joining us. Yes, I will switch off the camera. Okay, so thank you for joining us, everyone from Oh, Vina, nice to have you all the way from Brazil. Hare Krishna and Prabhu, it's nice to be Hare here Krishna. with you. So we have this amazing guest. You're wondering why we have a whole different setup today. So we have this amazing guest. He's a very dear friend of mine, an incredible man. Some people call him Chaitanya Charan, but some of you, you might, it's, it's, it's a tongue twister, you know? for many of us. So, you know, it's, his name is CC, you know, Chaitanya Charan. You can just call him Chaitanya or CC Ch Charan. or Charan, whatever, whatever floats your boat. He is an incredible man because he has dedicated his life to studying the yoga text. The Vedas are extremely vast and he just made a commitment to study in depth and not only study it, but really focus on... Nita, that camera is too far. Okay, that's fine. And I'm not used to technology, you know, as you can tell. And uh, Ashwini, so nice to see you online as well. And Sanika, welcome to the Heart Space. So he's been spending his life studying the Vedas and practicing the Vedas and then imbibing the mood of the Vedas. And after that, he has to, because part of, uh, part of the yoga practice system is that you must share the knowledge that you get. It's very vital. In order to have its full effect, you have to be, you have to share it with someone else. Otherwise, it's no fun. And so, he's written volumes of books. He currently has a podcast called The Monk's Podcast. And he gives Bhagavad Gita daily uh, classes, I think, his classes. And he's got over about 700,000 people following him on that. And he happens to be visiting Atlanta, so I said, why not put him on the hot seat? I mean, it's not really hot. It's actually, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty nice temperature. There's people here with no judgments. So I wanted him to share his, his beautiful deep intake as we study the, the nine islands of the heart, starting with Shravanam. And one day we'll also study the stem of this beautiful lotus flower. Everybody remembers this beautiful, this is what your heart looks like. So I'll now hand it over to Chaitanya Charan Prabhu. And then whenever you have questions, you can just write the questions. And I will also keep asking him questions on your behalf. So let us begin with words of wisdom from this amazing lifelong monk, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu. Thank you, Prabhu. So if you don't mind to first tell us, what is your understanding of the heart space? And how is it applicable for us living in a day-to-day -day life to try and find that space and live from that space? Yeah. So first of all, I'm grateful to be here. Thank you with you for inviting me. And uh, whatever he speaks about me is the potential that he sees in me. 
which will hopefully manifest in the future. Right now, I am simply a struggling student of the yoga texts, trying to apply them and trying to share them to my capacity. And I am amazed and inspired to see the many ways in which uh, my dear friend here, Vait uh, Prabhu, is actually sharing this yoga wisdom. He's here in Atlanta and all over the world. I travel all over the world, but I don't think I am as effective as he is without traveling even one tenth of what I do. So I'm happy to be here. And you can tell. Service. You can tell that he has sincere humility in his heart. Please carry on. Thank you. So I love the word heart space. My understanding of it would be two things. Firstly, we have. When we use the word heart itself, there is an ambiguity to it. There is the biological organ, the heart, which is at a particular space within our body. But most of the times when we use the word heart, we don't use it for the biological organ. And say, you broke my heart. That doesn't mean X-ray will show the fragments of the biological organ heart. We refer to the heart metaphorically as the seat of emotions. And not just emotions, but we can also say, values, values that center on our emotions, the thing that we value the most. So the, so the heart, when we refer to, is the seat of our emotions and especially our values combined with our emotions. So the thing that we deep care for the most, along with other things that we care for, those comprise our heart. And to be, to, in my understanding, to be situated in our heart space means to be aware of and to be aligned with the things that we value the most, the things that we feel most strongly about. And unfortunately, most of the world and we could say most of our mind, the world externally and our mind internally tend to dislodge us from our heart space, even alienate us from there. Because there are so many other things which pop up in front of us and they all seem more urgent and sometimes even more important. And thus we can spend days, hours, days, weeks, months and years never really doing the things that matter for us. So it's when we get into our heart space that's the time when we are aware of what really matters to us and then we can align our time, our energy and our life with the things that really matter. That's my understanding. What is your understanding when you started this uh, feature and uh, use the word heart space? So, as you know, in this heart space, we began, I think, about a week, two weeks ago. Many of you know my work, my seva in the world, is to disseminate the heart that I was able to capture of my teachers. I am simply uh, the Vi media, I feel, simply a little parrot, repeating what my teachers who have dedicated their lives to serving and nurturing the beautiful divine love that is existent and most of you know this word bhakti, in the heart. So for me, the heart space is a word that Keshavi Devi really liked it. So she said, we have to call our, uh, our, our Sangha, global Sangha as the heart space because we are not trying to connect with each other on an intellectual level or on an emotional level, but really from the level of the heart, from the level of bhakti, from the space of purity, from the space of sanctity, pristine, a space where there is no room for judgment, there is no space for uh, anything other than pure transcendental love. So for me, this is where I, you know, really, really attach myself to this, to this mission of helping people to understand this 
sacred space within themselves. And that is where bhakti happens. Bhakti is love, spiritual love. So Chaitanya Charan Prabhu has been practicing yoga for many, many years. So what has been some transformation that you have experienced in or what are some meditations that you have practiced to cultivate and nurture that heart? And how have you been able to share that heart with others? And why do you do it? Okay. Thank you. Just before that, I would like to reflect on what you said. So in one sense, the Sangha heart space is where we can share our heart and where we can realize what is of value to our heart. So this social heart space can help us all become situated more in our inner heart space. That way you can connect the two meanings. Correct. <laughs> yeah. So for me... Can I... you all hear him properly? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, for me, when I was growing up, I was growing, I grew up in India and I had a lot of faith in the power of education that if everybody could be more educated, then there are many more doors would open for them and they could have a better life and they could all help create a better world. And to that extent, uh, with that understanding, I dedicated myself to studying. When I was in college itself, I started conducting tuitions, free tuitions for uh, children from underprivileged backgrounds. And in that way, I was focused on education but then I noticed something disturbing, even distressing. I was at one of the top universities in India. But I noticed that educational brilliance did not correlate with uh, a good character or good values. I could see students who were far more brilliant than me. But many of them were quite short-sighted, self-centered. And really not thinking much about anything beyond their own pleasures. Now we could say that in, in the youth, that's how many people are. But I had thought that those who would be educated, those who would be in what we could call it, what I thought of as temples of learning, would have higher values. I could even see that some of the, there was one student whom I looked up to because he had been, he had been the first in the university for all his eight semesters. We had, I was studying engineering, electronics engineering. And he was brilliant at electronics. And yet he was a chain smoker. Now, it just didn't click for me. If he can figure out such complex electronics problems so easily, why can't he figure out that he's killing himself by smoking like this? So he told me that actually smoking helps me to think sharply. I thought, you know, the sharpness is cutting you. <laughs> What is the use of sharp thinking? It is hurting you. And then at that time, he got the highest paid job in the history of our college. He was considered to be like the iconic success story. But within the first six months of his working at that job, he was diagnosed with advanced lung cancer. And within a year of working at that job, he died. So that shook me up. And also... As I said, I was talking, I was trying to do free tuitions in various subjects, English, math, history, to underprivileged kids. And when I started talking with those kids, I started feeling that they started becoming friends and they started caring about their home situations. And most of their parents were, not parents, mostly fathers, were alcoholics. And it was domestic violence. And I had the stereotype that... Uh, Somebody who's an alcoholic is a person who is irresponsible and uh, reckless and somebody who's drunk and lying on the street. But when I talked with those fathers, they were very appreciative that I was coming and teaching their children. And they said that, I hope we hope the best for our children. Then those kids told me that once they get a bottle in their hands, they become like a different person. So I started thinking at that time that, am I really... When he says bottle in your hands, meaning... Getting, uh, drinking Se alcohol. Severely drunk. Okay. <laughs> Bottle in the hand. <laughs> okay. So, you know. Maybe there's some of my Indian usages. You can... No, no, no. It's really funny because that expression, when I was growing up in the monastery, a common theme was 
if someone carried a bottle, even if, even if it was a seven up bottle, we immediately thought this person is a very sinful person because he's drinking alcohol because we didn't know any better. Mm. So if, so that expression is commonly used in India, a bottle in hand, which automatically means you're an alcoholic. So just clarifying that yeah. for some of you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so then we, as a part of that organization on behalf of which I was doing these tuition classes, we decided to get into some kind of work to help people become free from alcohol. So we invited some anti-alcohol campaigners, few talks. I also learned some of those things. And we started sharing. And many of the parents, uh, the fathers especially, they started becoming free from it. In fact, one of us, a small village near our college, an entire village, we use the word in India, became dry, became sober. And we consider that a great success of our social outreach. But unfortunately, a few months later, there was a local municipality election. And one of the politicians, in order to woo the voters, brought two truckloads of free alcohol for everyone. And not only the fathers, <laughs> but even their kids got all drunk. And that was the time both I and some of my friends who were working together, we were quite disappointed. But that's when I started thinking that, you know, it's not just that education opens doors for people, but there is something inside us which stops us from walking through those doors. And I could see that this, this self-destructive instinct that was there in somebody who was super educated and super brilliant, like the, uh, like the student the top, the, we use in the other word topper, the number one student who was, of whom I mentioned earlier. And it was there in people who were relatively uneducated. They were living in underprivileged backgrounds. So that's the time when I started searching, you know, what is the self-destructive thing inside us? And I could also notice that it was there in me to some extent. I was infamous at that time for being short-tempered. And I could see that I was getting myself into unnecessary trouble. So, that, so that's when my reading started becoming a little more philosophical and I came across the Bhagavad Gita. So in the initially I was a little skeptical, is this book relevant to me? But when I read 336 in the Bhagavad Gita, I said, So Arjuna is asking Krishna, by what is one impelled to self-destructive acts? Uh, even if one doesn't want to, as if by force. I said, yeah, this was the exact question whose answer I was looking for. It took me some time to understand what the Bhagavad Gita's answer was and how that answer was relevant. But once I understood it, then I started applying the principles of the Bhagavad Gita, especially understanding its wisdom, understanding life's spiritual values and purposes, and doing uh, sonic meditation, mantra meditation, chanting the Hare Krishna mantra. And I found that my anger issues subsided sub substantially. One of my close friends was, he was in his college, in fact, he was very close to me, but he was gliding towards alcoholism. He also adopted the principles of the Bhagavad Gita and he just gave it up completely. So that's the time I felt that this was the education that was lacking in society. That yes, education can open new doors. Education can create the pathway to a better life. But this was the education that was lacking. That you know, we have much modern education and it's important in its own place. But that education can help us make the outer world better. It can help us create faster planes, better phones, better devices. But you know, better devices are good enough. But what about the vices inside? So <laughs> there are devices and there are vices. And if there are vices inside, the better the device is, the worse the vices become. Somebody who is distractible, they get devices, they'll get a million times more distracted. So I, to, I am sometimes known as the spiritual scientist. I love science and I love spirituality now. So I see that science can make things better in the outer world. Science can make the outer world better through improving devices. But spirituality can make the inner world better by reducing vices. And that's how science and spirituality both are needed for us to make a holistic difference in the world. 
So I, I was from a scientific background, but I felt that there are so many people who are studying science and there are so few people who are studying and sharing spirituality, especially spirituality presented from a rational, logical, scientific perspective. That's what I try to do. Any of you guys have any questions before we get into more questions from my side? Yeah, what is vices? I don't, and maybe I cannot find a translation. Devices I know, but I don't know the word vices. Yeah, if, you, if you Google vice, V-I-C-E, means bad habits. Okay, thank you. Of, yeah, impurities like lust, anger, greed, envy, yeah, as a vices. Thank you. So him being a spiritual scientist, I, I had mentioned to him about this nine islands of the heart. And we are covering only the first island and we haven't uh, discovered the whole paradise of beautiful islands that we have the, the great opportunity to fully explore and we haven't fully explored. So I was going to have him share more with us about... We discussed what hearing and listening and shravanam, the word shravanam in Sanskrit, what it means. So I wanted to uh, have him share with us in depth a little bit more about this shravanam. How is it directly connected to the heart? Thank you. Chitane Charam I try to gravitate, whatever subject I study, I try to gravitate to the Bhagavad Gita. Is one of the lesser known verses in the Gita which talk about this principle of Shravanam is 1326. In the 13th chapter, Krishna talks about various ways one can raise one's consciousness toward the spiritual level. And in 1325, he gives three paths. He talks about Karma Yoga, Gyan Yoga and Dhyan Yoga. And in 1326, the next verse after that, he says, Anye to eva majananta, shutva anye bhyopasate, te pichati taranteva, so he says that there are pe people apart from these three, those who follow Karma Yoga, Gyan Yoga, Dhyan Yoga, there are these people. They may not know much about spirituality. They may not know much about various technicalities of various parts. But Shutva Annebhya. They just hear from those who are wise. Shutva Annebhya. And then Upasate. They become attracted. Attracted to a higher reality. When they hear, then what happens? They will also go beyond. They will go beyond the cycle of birth and death. They will go beyond mortality. They will go beyond the misery that characterizes this world. And then Krishna uses the word. When will they do that? Shruti Parayana. So Parayana is devoted, dedicated. Shruti is to hearing. In the Bhakti tradition, often the word Narayana Parayana or Vasudeva Parayana. Those who are devoted to Narayana and Vasudeva, the names of the ultimate reality. But here it is said, those who are dedicated to hearing. Sometimes it's translated as those who are devotees of hearing. Shruti Parayana. Huh? So why is it so significant, this hearing? That it's, it's sometimes difficult to even conceive of some of higher reality, ultimate reality that we cannot perceive with our senses. But, and to become devoted to that may seem quite difficult. However, oh, a easier, more accessible step to that is to become devoted to the process that will take us there. And that is Shruti, Shravanam, Shruti Parayana. Huh? So now, to put it succinctly, that we can say our eyes take us toward illusion and our ears take us beyond illusion toward reality. So, this is what happens in the Bhagavad Gita at the start also, when Arjuna comes in the middle of the battlefield and he sees the two armies. In fact, uh, I've written several articles on this topic. In the first chapter, from 121 to around 126, when Arjuna is getting confused, Several times he uses the word Aikshita, I want to see. I, I see this. I want to see this. Now seeing is important, no doubt. But our eyes can very easily drag us into illusion. 
because the world is filled with captivating captivating objects which can allure us and deter us from exploring anything deeper on the other hand what happens to arjuna is that he hears the gita and by hearing the gita his illusion gets dissipated at the end he says nashto moha smritil lamta and how did it happen tat prasadan he hears from arjuna in fact the last question that krishna asks to arjuna or you can say the only question that krishna asks arjuna in the gita there are 17 questions that arjuna asks krishna but the only question that krishna asks arjuna is kachit etat shrutam partha tvai ekagrena chitasa were you able to hear attentively and the logical corollary of that question is was your illusion dispelled so the idea is that through hearing arjuna's illusion gets dispelled so so the eyes are often the pathway to illusion and the ears are the pathway to the reality beyond illusion so that's why uh, hearing is so important now of course the eyes can also be the pathway to reality when we come in spiritual places and we associate spiritual people and we see spiritual imagery that's also possible and the ears can also take us into illusion if we hear uh if we hear just mundane or sensuous or uh spiritually irrelevant or distracting stuff but broadly speaking in the bhakti tradition and in the broad yoga tradition it is a shruta ikshita pathah that it is the ears that inform our vision that it's not that we reject our eyes as source of illusion but rather when our ears when what we hear they inform our vision then shruta ikshita patha then the path to the ultimate reality opens for us the eyes guided by the ears will show us the path to the ultimate reality that's why hearing is so important to align ourselves with the things that really matter for us because the eye is will often ca- captivate us with things that are superficial things that are titillating things that are giving some instant pleasure some dopamine hit but afterwards they just become insubstantial but hearing reminds us of the things of enduring value and inspires us to realign our life with those enduring values it reminded me of something very interesting that i was told by my teacher in the monastery <clears throat> he explained shravanam he said you must do nityam bhagavata sevaya you must serve the bhagavata the, the transcendental uh, essence of spiritual knowledge and vibration and that you should do with your ears so and i said okay i get it he says no you have to eat with your ears and i said that is i said shravanam doesn't mean that he said no shravanam means you eat with your ears that means when you eat something you should be able to extract and digest what you eat and then whatever it is that you ate with your ears you should apply it and use that energy and resources to apply it into your day to day life so shravanam what he explained to me was not just hearing but listening deep within from your heart and making sure that everything that you hear you actually try and practically apply it and through the process of application you will then be able to have realizations which will then be part of your uh, your experience of the divinity within this world and within ourselves and thereby they become assets that carry us through very difficult parts and 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 aspects of our lives so it is interesting that the emphasis is so much on really listening uh, from our heart so chitanya charan prabhu if you could explain a little bit more uh, if you can elaborate on this point what you mentioned just now i will have you elaborate yeah it's very i'll have chitani charan prabhu elaborate this one it's a very beautiful point that it said that hearing can be at three levels one is hearing simply at the level of the ears we hear it 
and we don't pay much attention to it. Just some information comes in, the perception goes in, and it doesn't even stay for very long. It's like uh, we hear something, and even before that hearing is over, we have forgotten most of it. Now, that can happen to all of us because we have finite brain capacities. But at least we try to engage ourselves intellectually. So hearing it, there's only at the level of the senses. That is, you could say, the least effective hearing. That is also beneficial, especially because if we, if we are hearing spiritual sounds, then just that contact with the sound is itself edifying. It is sanctifying. But it is of extremely limited value. It's like somebody gets a million dollars and uh, a child gets a million dollars. And a child thinks, oh, you know, if I can just get a chocolate with it, I'll be happy. If you have a million dollars, you could get a million chocolates with them or more. But the child is just using a million dollars for getting a, a one chocolate. So that's like underusing hearing if we just treat it at the level of information. And that's one of the biggest obstacles. Sometimes when we hear, we often start thinking, I know this. And then we don't explore it any further. I know this, so we turn off mentally. Then that is not very helpful. So then the next level is hearing where it goes from the ears to the head. That is where it becomes comprehension. Okay. There is the point and there is the point of the point. I know this point. Okay, that's okay. But why is this point being spoken? In this particular context, what is the thought flow? What is this example for? What is the point of this point? When we start doing that, then we start gaining comprehension. That's why there is engagement of the head required and that's considered a deeper level of hearing. Not just the senses, but you could say the sense, the, the sense bearing faculty, that is the intelligence, the head. Now, beyond that, so the second level, third level is from the head, it enters into the heart. That happens when we don't just think how, don't just ask, how does this make sense? What is the point of this point? But rather, how does this point apply to me? How does this relate with me and my values? When we make that relevant, how can I use this to change my life, to change myself? So that is where the service attitude comes in. So we are hearing not just to gain some information, not just to gain some comprehension. Both of these could be done in the mood of mastery. Now, I will tell the whole world how much I know. I will tell the whole world how, how clever I am. Now, what does that say? Some people say, my humility is my greatest quality. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is an indirect contradiction. <laughs> so, if somebody is humble, they won't think that they have great qualities. So, unfortunately, what happens is that at the level of the ears or at the level of the head, we may use this knowledge to simply boost our ego. Even spiritual knowledge can be used for a non-spiritual purpose. But when we let the knowledge enter the heart, or when does the knowledge, when does the doorway to the heart open? When we approach it with sevaya, may the pro quoted the verse, Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya. Sevaya means service, with a service attitude. This knowledge, this wisdom is actually a manifestation of the divine. And the divine is not to be mastered, not to be conquered, is not to be made a servant of my ego. Rather, the divine is to be served. So how can I apply this knowledge? How can I internalize this knowledge? So when we, how can I serve this knowledge? What does serve this knowledge means? Mold my life according to this knowledge. So when we have that attitude, that's when it enters into the heart. That's when we are actually opening ourselves for this knowledge to transform us. Otherwise, we are simply thinking of using the knowledge to do what we want to do. That is also good. We'll be doing whatever we are doing in a more informed, maybe a wiser way. But we could say that we have gurus 
and the purpose of the guru is not just to sanction our way it is to show us the way it is not just to sanction our way oh yeah what you are doing is good yeah it's good but there is so much more you can do in life to show us the way so that is possible when the knowledge enters the heart so hearing at the level of the ears just gives us some information hearing at the level of the head gives us comprehension but hearing at the level of the heart brings about transformation it changes us it aligns our values with with that which is of eternal value that which is of supreme value and that's the transformation that can bring the greatest value to our life beautiful chetan charan for and another thing that i was thinking as you were speaking is how listening from the heart actually helps to build character and society today as you may observe and especially someone like dhyana devi who is working in the field interacting with uh a lot of dented cans as we say it as an expression you can see that there's so there is a vacancy it's it's uh, it's void some people because this character is missing in their lives so through hearing through through listening from the heart we are actually truly able to connect with other hearts and that's what dhyana devi was that was uh, writing to me about earlier in her work it's so important that when we communicate with the world we communicate with the heart and we speak from the heart with the heart and to the heart and this is why bhakti is should be the center of our lives when we do our morning sadhana you know it is extremely vital for us to spend that quality time with our heart space it's just you and this transcendental heart space meditation mantra just bonding and connecting and just having that deepest relationship because when we do the heart space mantra we we gen- we, we intentionally take our awareness to every single syllable that comes out of our mouth and be in that space in company in association of that powerful sound vibration then what happens it the 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 antennas become more uh, in tuned with the spiritual energies of the world the spiritual vibrations of the world and all the incredible communications and informations that we can gather from our interactions with others and with various aspects of life so we have 10 minutes i'm so grateful to each and every one of you for those of you who have on video would you like to share as we know it is extremely vital that this doesn't become something that you listen and it just sticks with the senses but it actually goes to your mind and your heart so if you don't mind to share for those of you who would be happy to share about what is your what is your reflection on this beautiful discussion from chitani charan prabhu so we'll start with uh, narayani devi would you like to share please you can just raise your hand if you don't want to share <laughs> um hari krishna thank you so much for this beautiful information from the heart to my heart and um <clears throat> i'm just grateful honestly to be reminded you know um to spend that time chanting the maha mantra um and getting myself connected with my heart so that i can connect to other people's hearts and not get caught up in these lower vibrations of jealousy lust you know greed 
just none of that serves me, you know, none of it serves any of us. So when we're connected into the heart <clears throat> by taking that time, you know, it's just, you can, I just love connecting with people from that space. And thank you for, for these helpful reminders. And I really want to go on and read these, um, Bhagavad Gita verses that you quoted 336, 326, 325. So thank you. Excellent. Yeah. That is 1326. 1326. 336 and 1326. Okay, we have uh, Claudia. She's such an eloquent speaker. Share with us your reflection. Um, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, so I liked a lot um, when uh, you said that um, science can make the out outer world better, but spirituality can make the inner world better. Um, so yeah, and then um, uh, yeah, yeah, I like the part with uh, like uh, as well with the hearing having where you can hear from three levels and how important is the third one uh, when the knowledge goes from the mind to the heart. Beautiful. Thank you yeah. so much, Claudia. Yeah. Diana Davy. Thank you very much. This is, this is very, very important to me. Um, I'm thinking about how my training as a therapist only goes so far that the schooling that I have does not encompass um, the heart to heart kind of communication that you all are talking about right now. And um, that's an education that I think is really very important as a therapist and as just a person. So thank you. Thank you so much. Ingrid. Okay, there is a question. Yes. Keshavi. We have Nita, you have an upbeat song. Ready? Keshavi, you can read the question. Uh, I don't see one. Someone put it on the chat. I think Andre put it on the chat. Click and see. Andre, would you like to tell us what is that beautiful question you have? I'm trying to. Do you see me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Ah, okay. Because I have problem. Uh with the computer. So uh, I just uh, went to the Ragadash in Durbuy in Belgium and I lost my heart there, but I have That's a, a lot of- That's a good place to lose your heart. Yes, I know it's a good place. I already miss it. So, so you have to go back there to find it. I know, I know I have to go back. Uh, <laughs> that's the point I know, but I have a lot of, uh, I know it's not necessary, but I still have a lot of guilt and I have the feeling I lost so many time in things that not so good, that not trusted also as spiritual so good. And I have a lot of guilt and sorrow and... Inta, can you have a kirtan ready when we end? I'm crying all the time the last time and I don't know what to do with it. I have a lot of pain, so... I feel very guilty for the things I've done and it's so many time I lost to do things that not so good that not so good for the spiritual way and for my body and I don't know how to handle it at the moment. It's very hard, so I'm trying to do the mantra the krita. I meditate now, but I'm scared that I'm gonna lose it again. So yeah, that's what I want to share. <laughs> Beautiful, beautiful. And it's okay to feel guilty. Mm. It's, it's not, it's not, it's human. Mm. And it's completely normal. Okay. 
Now, you know, just making sure that you're in the right association. Mm. You have people like Kamala, who is there in Belgium. She is a, she is a heart specialist. Okay. And she can she knows how to repair hearts. That's great. So I would say that it's such a beautiful question. Chaitanya Charan Prabhu, please, would you like to share something? And we have five minutes. Sure. I'm sorry you are going through such distress. And uh, I'll say that two things I'll say that. First is that we can look at our life from our perspective and from a divine perspective. So we use the word Krishna consciousness. Krishna consciousness can mean two things. To become conscious of how we are acting in relationship well, with Krishna. To be conscious of how we are acting in relationship with Krishna. And it also means to be conscious of how Krishna is acting in relationship with us. So from the first perspective, yes, each one of us can think of things we have done that we are not proud of. Some of us, may, some of those may be worse than others. And from that perspective, to feel regret is a part of Krishna consciousness. To feel guilt is, yeah, I could have made better choices and I didn't. But at the same time, Krishna consciousness is not limited only to what we did or we didn't do. Krishna consciousness also means to know that Krishna has always been acting in our life. And Krishna, no matter what turns we may take in our life, Krishna has a plan to take us to a better place. The very fact that you could go to Radhadesh and you got this experience, as you said, you lost your heart here. That means you are still in Krishna's loving hands. And it is Krishna who enabled you to have this experience. And that is what will help us to move forward. So it is that Krishna is like the ultimate GPS when we are going on the road, you know, the GPS shows us the best way to move forward. But some, the GPS says, turn right, turn right. And say, we turn left. What does the GPS do at that time? GPS doesn't say, you didn't obey me, get lost. No, the GPS immediately reroutes and says, okay, from here, you go ahead and turn right and you will be back on the track. So Krishna is like that ultimate GPS. Even if we have taken wrong turns, still Krishna is always there to reroute us and to take us closer to him. So in one sense, we could say that because of my past choices, uh, I lost so much time. And that's one way which is favorable to our feeling Krishna conscious. But another way to understand is that even if we have made some mistakes, Krishna is so expert that his plan can work even through our mistakes. And he can draw us closer to him even through whatever bad choices we have made. Our mistakes are not Krishna's plan. But Krishna's plan can work even through our mistakes. That is Krishna's expertise. So that's one thing to give us hope and not let us feel negative about it. Another point I would like to say is that now, guilt can very guilt is good in the sense that guilt is like a psychological defense mechanism from unhealthy choices. Just like if we go close to fire, we feel heat and our hand recoils from it. So that's a physical defense mechanism that is innate to us. Mm -hmm. So similarly, guilt is a psychological defense mechanism that deters us from unhealthy choices. However, guilt can sometimes misfire. That means guilt and pseudo-guilt can look very similar. So I'll explain what I mean by this. Say, if I am here and the right thing that I'm supposed to do is here and something wrong which I should not do is here. That's my little finger. And so the middle finger is I. The little finger is the, wrong, the thing I don't want to do. I should, the, the thumb is the thing which I should be doing. So guilt should be like our ring finger, which comes in between us and the wrong thing that we should not do. But sometimes the mind is so sneaky, like I earlier said, the mind can use our humility to make us proud. Hmm? 
so the mind can also use our guilt to not stop us from doing the wrong thing but to stop us from doing the right thing that means the guilt can come not in the place of our ring finger but in the place of our point finger oh i wasted so much time so what is the use i made so many mistakes what is the hope for me so if guilt is coming between us and the right thing then we have to understand that is that is guilt being hijacked guilt being misused it is pseudo guilt so if that is coming then put it aside yes and focus on the fact that yes i made mistakes maybe they are terrible mistakes but krishna has not rejected me and the opportunity for me to reconnect with him is still there so let me focus on that and that way we can keep moving forward so if guilt stops us from doing the unhealthy things that's good if guilt stops us or discourages us from doing the right thing then see that also as a as a illusion as guilt being misused exploited and keep it away keep a distance from it knowing that krishna still has a plan for us i hope that answers the question yeah hari krishna thank you very much thank you, i also want to thank you everybody who's giving me message so thank you there's a lot of love thank you very much thank you thank you so much a little louder so i just wanted to let you all know that uh we're so grateful and we also have mohini with us and her beautiful baby namaste namaste to you welcome home oh thank you, so <laughs> thank you so much thank you so much for coming of course yeah, thank you so much for joining us good day and yana devi narayani devi claudia and i think we also had yeah sandra kamala devi ashwini nice to see you again alina always happy to see you audrey danny nice to see your face anandini vina all the way in brazil and then we have riley all the way in florida richard i'm not sure where you're located richard are you in japan maybe maybe not yes i'm still yes. in japan yes same richard is all the way in japan thank you richard nice to see you and then we have keshavi richard i have someone here from alabama who's going to japan i'm going to connect you with him so you can keep him in shape and then mohini so mm. happy to see you online that's an honor to be on this call guru babe thank you keshavi devi thank you for making this beautiful space where it's free of judgment where everyone gets to pour their hearts out and nourish their individual hearts and so grateful to chaitanya charan prabhu he's traveling around the world he's about to head out to australia but we were able to kidnap him for the day he's in atlanta for a few days and and uh, incredible incredible lessons and kani it is nice to see you joining us and here we have our amazing crew of oh, let's see i got to turn on the video you have to be able to say hi to everybody here here we go we have names um and then here we have blake thank you so much so thank you all very much namaste everyone <laughs>